Today's June 26, 2017. You're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 47. We're back after a week-long hiatus. This is the only podcast that'll bring you news about autonomous cars in politics. Politics, man. I'm telling you. Intuitive design meets bond-diffusing robots, the IEEE's weirdest biomedical robots, and more. We're also covering two Reddit posts this week to make up for our absence last week. And you know what? Human Factors cast is back. So strap on your VR headset and get ready on that stationary bike because the show starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey everybody, welcome back. It's Human Factors Cast. We are back for another exciting week of Human Factors news and Reddit posts and community outreach and stuff. I'm your host, Nick Rome, here, joined today by your my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf is over there. Oh, we are finally back again, Mr. Nick. I'm so glad to be back on the power of the interweb. There he is. All right, man. So I have to know, we had two whole weeks where we were not on the air. What happened? Oh, man. Lots of stuff happened. I flew on a bunch of airplanes, hung out in the hot tub, enjoyed some Father's Day weekend with the pops. How about you, man? Oh, man. So let me tell you. Uh, actually, let me pull back the curtain a little bit and explain why we were not on the air last week to our listeners. So... Anyone who knows me knows that I'm a big gamer, right? And so uh, a couple of buddies and I play this uh, game, Final Fantasy XIV. The newest expansion came out, Stormblood. Without getting too nerdy on everything, uh, you know, I played a lot. And I think this had a major hit on my immune system. And Monday morning, I woke up sick with a sore throat. Like, to, to be clear, I didn't even sleep on Friday. I took time off of work to play this game. I didn't sleep on Friday. And so, again, I think it made a huge hit on my, like, immune system. Could not even talk. So podcasting was a little bit out of the question last week. But let me comment on this launch, man. So this launch was messy. So this is an online game. And imagine, like, what would happen if a million people were trying to get into Disneyland all at once. So the game comes out at 2 a.m. on Friday morning. And everyone's trying to access this one node. And because everyone, 20 minutes in to the story, is trying to access the one node, it breaks it. So no one can get past 20 minutes into the story. So, Oh, my goodness. So how long did it take to remedy that? So this was Friday. Uh, it didn't get resolved until Saturday morning. Um, and so everyone was like scrambling, trying to figure out what to do, how to progress still using the old content uh, you know, and, and, and without being able to go further. So, you know, we were stuck in the first area. You couldn't really get very far. You couldn't do much. So people were like creating, like there were a few people that got through and those few people were able to get other people to the other areas sneakily through game mechanics. So it was, it was actually kind of fun to see the community kind of rally against, um, this unfortunate mishap, uh, they later attributed it to DDoS attacks, but honestly, it sounds kind of like a front for what actually happened, which was everybody was trying to access the same nodes at the same time. So Just basically a DDoS attack without some of the nastiness behind it. So, I mean, they could pass it off as that if they really want to. Exactly, exactly. So that was my week. I mean, you know, I, I liberated a city. Um, and, you know, not much else happened. So uh, I, I want to know what's going on with you, though, man. All right, so I've got two really bad UX situations that I ran into because uh -oh. my dad's an older guy. I visited him for Father's Day in Jersey, and every time I go, he's always got either something with his computer or with his house that he wants me to fix. So the first one, and I won't name the software, but I had <laughs> to, it, it's just one of the, it's a uh, it's a dictation software, and it's kind of expensive. But he wanted to like upgrade his software, so okay, what do I do? You just go upgrade the software, you go through a typical e-commerce checkout process, sure, sure. fill in your billing address, your credit card information, and they take your money. Except there was a really big flaw in the e-commerce process. They couldn't figure out that I had actually in all of my billing information, and the only error I got was that there was no billing code. So, so they refused to take my money. So let's recap. So you're trying to upgrade the software. 
there's no yeah. th- th- there's no like data validation in the forms to is it is it the data validation or you hit submit or what happened uh, what it is, what it is, is after hitting the submit there was no back end processing that actually allowed you to continue and didn't have anything on their site and allowed like customers to know like hey you can't do anything right now cuz we've got some problems the stuff's down cuz this is like a it's a big launch for an upgraded software and a companion app so similar to kind of what I guess Final Fantasy, a lot of people try and do this at once, and it just crashed. Uh, so the problem that I had, the biggest problem I had with it is like, okay, so they won't take my money. I have to call customer support, but the customer support process was basically them having to buy it for you, wow. and they were having to collect so much information. I didn't feel comfortable giving it to them. Like passwords and also and like all sorts of different credit card stuff. So, so it was one of those things where like it was too much barrier to want to even pay for it. So let me ask you: Was it uh, so? So they were they they were asking you for all the same information that the computer asks you for, but it was a human doing it. Yeah. Well, I think the problem was is I felt like there was I had less confidence in the like the person I was talking to than just giving it to the, the database and the computer to keep in like a secure process. Right. Cause I'm giving like all this information over the phone. I don't know. There's plenty of stories you talked about where things listen in and I just didn't have a whole lot of confidence in the representative that I was using. And they were like trying to change passwords and stuff without me knowing. So it was just a really weird experience. Well, that's, I'm sorry, man, that really sucks. That's a, that's a sucky experience. I'm sorry you had to, experience that with uh whatever the company was i I know a few of them it is what it is man uh i want to talk about the second point that you have here you have aquatic tools what is that okay so i never knew that this was something you could do to a hot tub but apparently you can put a tv in it what so yeah 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 so the old man has a tv in his hot tub it like pops up from the base of the hot tub and you can see it man but they but what they didn't do when they designed it was make a remote that can withstand water for long <laughs> periods of time. <laughs> wow, that seems like something that you would think is just goes hand in hand with a hot tub TV. Yeah, and it, the funny part was is it was like the way it was designed, the buttons just were not ready to retain water, which is going to happen if you have a hot tub with a TV remote. It's going to fall in the water. Uh, but also like a lack in, like when you take the battery out, all the memory from the remote is gone. <laughs> that's frustrating so it's just like some weird some kind of weird just design and there's not many companies that do it so him and i were talking this is the next million dollar human factors idea right here make a usable hot tub remote man so my my initial thought on that was why don't they just put it on the sides you know like put a remote control on the sides built into the hot tub the only reason i can think of it is because it's kind of big and let's say you had a bunch of people around i don't know it's a pain to swim back and forth, maybe. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that makes sense to have like extra controls because I mean, that's why our TVs have both a remote and controls on the TV, right. so you can mess with it if some, if one fails, right? Yeah. Well, you know, I haven't heard of uh, TVs in hot tubs, but what about time machines? <laughs> uh, now that that was broken, so I didn't <laughs> get to use it. That was broken, <laughs> so you couldn't go back to 1980. Okay. All right. Well. I mean, do you have anything else to share? We were off for two whole weeks, so there's a lot to cover in terms of news. Um, you know, we we have we're covering about half of them this week because we had so much. But uh, we'll get to the other half next week. Do you have any other stuff that you want to talk about before we move into the news? Uh, the only one thing I do have to say is I can't believe that Stormblood had such a problem because I was in L.A. yesterday for a meeting and I saw the giant billboard covering an entire building. Oh yeah, so I assumed if they could drop that on drop the money on putting that big big old uh, banner up it would be you know okay to play for the weekend but who knows right well yeah i mean let me say like everybody was upset about it everyone was like how come they couldn't prepare for this all the advertising and all the it was it was a mess but that being said they handled it quite nicely and you know we ended up being able to beat the whole thing um by the time thursday ran around so it was a long story so anyway All right, man, uh, I'm ready to move on to the news. Are you good? Let's do it. All right, so this is the part of the show all about Human Factors news. Now, this could be anything from medical, transportation, psychology, artificial intelligence. 
whatever it is, you name it, as long as it relates to the field of human factors. Blake, what do we got up first this week? So first up, we're talking automated vehicles. So the American transportation industry has been calling for national rules governing self-driving cars, and it looks like we might get our wish. So Senators Bill Nelson, Gary Peters, and John Thune have revealed the principles they'll use to craft legislation that greenlights autonomous vehicles. Safety will be a top priority, of course, but they also want to make sure that laws are tech neutral, clear up the res- the roles and responsibilities of both federal and state governments, as well as improve cars' online security. Additionally, they want to reduce the existing roadblocks in the law that, after all, many laws assume that someone needs to take the wheel of a vehicle. No matter which political party you align with, there are strong incentives to shake up the rules. Uh, on the side of Republicans, you may get looser regulations. And in terms of Democrats, you may get safer cars while everyone gets a boost to their local economies. Now, a lot of you might be asking, what does this have to do with human factors or any of the things we talk about on this show? But it does have a really big role to play because there's we can't really release these cars into the wild without some rules to govern what happens when things go wrong or how traffic will exist with them in it. Right. No, you make a great point. I I think the reason I picked this story is because not only will we have to deal with the human in the loop problem of autonomous vehicles, right? We won't have, we'll have to deal with that as well as the laws of the land, like how we, what we as users, quote unquote, know about the laws and who is responsible in certain situations where, you know, it it might be my responsibility as a driver uh, of this autonomous vehicle to get out of the way of something dangerous or save somebody's life if the automation takes control in such a way that would endanger people. So I, I think it's completely worth talking about. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I think that it's good to see these kind of legislation measures getting more and more pressed because I know I I wish I could remember how long. I feel like it's been at least a month where we started seeing articles that were talking about that this needed to happen to really see autonomous vehicles in terms of cars come like take off. Uh, But the the best part that I see in here is this tech neutral idea. So building laws that are just going to be very able to like attack the space generally, not like focus on any kind of specific tech, because I feel like as this grows, tech's going to change so rapidly that law would not be able to even keep up. Yeah. I mean, we talked a a couple of weeks ago about how the iteration process in healthcare and software, uh, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago and I feel like it's going to be the same thing here. You're going to want some standards that they'll have to adhere to, but you don't want them to be so, rigid that they that the software can't adapt to fix these sort of problems and i think you know different companies will use different proprietary methods to establish this automation but they'll all still have to meet these same safety standards they'll still have to meet these same um, online security standards they'll have to meet these human in the loop standards that we keep talking about on the show so there's a lot of there's a lot of ways that you can do that. And by keeping it tech neutral, I think that'll that'll really encourage innovation in the field. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. The one part that I am concerned about, and I feel like everybody in the media nowadays, and, and especially recently, like cybersecurity is a big deal. And when you start talking about cars, they're basically going to have a lot of just horsepower in terms of like processing and technology. This this initiative to at first try and figure out what's going to go on in terms of cars online security is probably going to play a big role. And I feel like in the space of building autonomous cars and taking into account the kinds of like different DDoS attacks that can be launched by people is really going to play a big part in how these infrastructure systems get built for cars. Oh yeah. Think about these as weapons, man, cars just driving according to some hackers, like pre-programmed plans like this is crazy stuff that so yeah i'm glad they're focusing on cybersecurity as well um now we of course want to talk about the um shoot where was i going with that <laughs> we we want to talk about this so so this this reducing existing ro- roadblocks 
and uh, federal and state governments. So I wanted to talk quickly about this because it's going to be interesting to see what the federal government is going to be required uh, or, or the requirements for the federal government versus the state government and what sort of permissions will change based on states. Right. Like like what kind of things are going to be different in California versus Arizona versus, you, you know, at the at the uh, the country level. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting point, Nick, because I'm not sure what would be the difference, except for like on the state grounds i could see how it becomes the state's responsibility in some aspects to make sure that like as the technology grows that part of their like traffic systems get the updates in terms of like cameras they may need or whatever the car actually has to use but i'll be it's going to be cool to see what the federal government does in terms of like does it build a new agency that's for autonomous cars right yeah i mean only time will tell and they they uh kind of they loosely defined these things. They basically said, yeah, it's going to be safety. We're going to make them tech tech neutral. Uh, We're defining the roles and online security is important to us. That's all they said. And so it's going to be interesting to see what the final thing uh, that they come up with, this final law that they come up with is. And uh, we will be sure to keep all of our Human Factors Cast listeners in the loop. (laughs) Ha ha. See what I did there? (laughs) About what is going on. So good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, man. Well, I think that is a good... uh, Do you have anything else to add on that before we move on to the next one? Well, just in case any of these wonderful senators are actually listening, please make sure that you employ like the right technologists when you're putting these laws together to kind of help you understand where technology is going and how it will affect not just people in the short term, but the long term implications. But I think other than that, this is cool to see. You heard it here first, folks. Uh, uh, Human Factors Cast is the only podcast that U.S. senators listen to uh, for their human factors needs. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that's too awesome. All right, you ready to move on, Mr. Nick? Let's go, man. All right. So Resquared Robotics has developed a robot that makes diffusing a bomb as easy as pouring a glass of water. What? Using a... <laughs> I know, right? Using a control scheme that mimics human arm movements. So Resquared's military robots have two arm-like limbs that are controlled remotely by an operator using a device that allows them to manipulate the, ro- the robot's arms similar to similarly to how we as humans move our own arms. So this can... Control screen was originally developed by Pittsburgh-based Carnegie Mellon, and as a result of the growing movement of biomimicry in the robotics field. So more and more engineers continually are looking toward nature for inspiration of how robots should move or how we should be able to interact with them. So in the case of ReSquare's robotics manipulation system, it was right in front of the researchers the whole time. And what better scheme could there be for controlling robotic grippers than our very own arms. Now, this has got a lot of different far-reaching implications, and I feel like there's a big debate in robotics about how much you use like nature or human form to mimic what you do in the robot world, because ultimately you're trying to overcome some of the shortcomings of a human. So, sure. Nick, you have a very good mind for some of this stuff. What do you What do you think about this article? Well, man, let me back up a second and tell you what I would use robot arms for. I've had this thought. Okay, and this is gonna be this is gonna sound really dumb, and I hate to do this right in the middle of a serious article, but dude, I've always had this kind of thought of like, man, wouldn't it be great if I had a robot that sat behind me that mimics my arm movements and I could scratch my own back. Hey man, that's not bad. Nah. So that's kind of what I thought about this. And, and you bring up a good point with this whole debate about whether or not we should, uh, sort of make these robots analogous to the human form. And I think the answer is yes. In something like this, where you want precision, you don't want to have, to have them learn this whole new control scheme. You want that to be natural. You want them to be able to defuse this bomb. It makes sense in this kind of situation where you are, um, you are doing something really dangerous. And so you put a robot there instead of a human. Now in cases like where you are controlling a vehicle or something, the control scheme you'd want more analogous to how you control a car or a remote control car or something like that. So, I think every sort of control scheme has its own case, but in this case, I I think this is a great sort of way to um, 
I, I think this is a great application for mimicking the human form. Yeah, and honestly, I'm I'm kind of split on this one uh, because in the article there's there's a a phrase or not a phrase there's a sentence in there that can go either way, and that's that this does have a pretty steep learning curve, but it only takes a few hours to get the adjustments down to really figure out what you're doing. And of course, you get a lot of training with, in this case, a demolition squad using a robot. Uh, but what I also picked up from the article that I thought was interesting is things like this have also been controlled in the past um, by military professionals using just off-the-shelf controllers like an Xbox controller. Yeah. Um, and I'm assuming that what the real benefit of this is, like taking a closer look at Resquared's um, manipulation system, is when it gets to the thumb controls, which allow you to do a lot more precise movements, which I'm, I would assume give you a lot more degrees of freedom than what you would get off of like an Xbox controller. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you bring up a good point where, um, where you know... It, Look, a lot of the people going into the military now are gamers, and you got to appeal to what their skill set is, and they know how to control an avatar uh, in a virtual environment, or rather just a robot with grippers. They know how to control these things based on um, you know the control scheme that they grew up with, essentially. And so... Um, you know, having having that, it's not that big of a mapping. Uh, but I think if you if you do have those more degrees of freedom, they are able to uh, more precisely. It, it almost requires a little bit more focus, but I feel like that trade off is worth it if you're doing something like defusing bombs. Yeah, and I I think you're right. The only I just thought of this, and I'm not sure how much weight it's going to hold, but I I think the issue maybe between the Xbox controller and let's say something like this is almost how it's mapped and how many buttons you have. Cause like, I, I feel like there is almost enough. Now I've never been even in a training simulation where these kinds of robots would be used. So I don't even know the extent of what they can do, but it seems like it's a really high powered camera to give you some good visuals and some pretty, uh, pretty useful hands, but it looks like, three prong grips and i feel like you could get away with a lot of this stuff using just a basic controller but yeah again though i th i think what happens is you're you're kind of repurposing something off the shelf that's not meant to do this and that's the beauty of the robot yeah i agree so you have some uh some descriptions here of the control system do you want to go over those uh, yeah, this is just to give people that have looked at the article a little more sense of what this thing looks like. Uh, so picture, a, and I'll describe the robot real briefly. I mean, it looks almost a little bit like Wally, but he's got like two really long gripping arms. Uh, it runs on like tread motors that you would kind of see on a tank, but a lot smaller. And then a small camera, which is the head. Uh, but the control system sits actually on a tripod. So this control system is remote, so away from the actual robot. This is where your operator would be standing and kind of has their arms out where they're actually able to maneuver these two grips that are mounted on bar bars that curl over and think of like bicycle racing handlebars. So you're just kind of standing in place and you've got your hand on these two like grippers. They're, they're almost uh, like joysticks, yeah. Yeah, like that's kind of what joysticks. they remind me of, like really nice elongated joysticks. Right. And then on each grip, there's just a series of buttons that you can control with your thumb. So this is a lot of the fine movements with the camera. And this this is where it comes into kind of like that thumb dexterity and being able to have everything in one place to make those fine mov movement controls. Um, but and as they say, like kind of like introducing somebody to Xbox for the first time, there is a learning curve, but people get are able to do do the tasks pretty well within a couple of hours. So that's a pretty great, um, pretty great learning time at least. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. And I'm I'm curious as to what the learning time for a controller would be, since it feels like maybe there would be less input as in terms of you know, raw input methods go. So I don't know. It'd be interesting to see, and and also what the efficacy of it is. How how accurately can you disarm bombs? How, what's the success rate? all of this stuff is also important to look at. Yeah, because I actually I really encourage you guys to go read the TechCrunch article for this one because the uh, author actually got to use the robot and he provides a pretty funny narrative about trying to use the arms and the clunkiness of it. Um, but also having a lot of people watching you try and use a robot for the first time is nerve-wracking in and of itself. But I mean, 
it mimics being able to do something a human would do, which is like take a bag, open it, take something out of it, and then go through diffusing procedures. Um, and I feel like now that we're kind of digging a little deeper, this system is a lot more equipped for that than like something built off the shelf that's not necessarily for this purpose. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I agree. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts on this one, Blake? Honestly, no. I would love to get to see this thing up close, though, because I'm very interested by the control controls that are on the thumbs. But other than that, this is pretty cool. One. Yeah, man. Uh, I have to agree. I think this is... I, I would also like to try this out. And I would like to do an A-B test between, you know, the, the actual movements as well as uh, with with a controller. I think I think doing that might be kind of fun. But before we move on to our next story, I just want to thank all of our friends over at Engadget, TechCrunch, uh, uh, let's see here, what do we got? Spectrum, IEEE, and Wired for bringing us all our new stories this week. Sorry, I lost my place on the show notes there. <laughs> if you want to follow along with these uh, with these stories as we post them, go ahead and point your browser over to the Human Factors Cast Facebook page, LinkedIn or all our social media. We're always posting those as we find them so you can follow along. All right, Blake, let's go ahead and move on to the next article. What do we got up next? So guys, we've talked about this on the show a bunch that there are far reaching possibilities for VR outside of just video games. And here is kind of a new take on VR in a combination with exercise. So this year at E3, VIR, I think it's Ver Zoom, showed off its new VR VZ sensor, which is a small device that attaches to the crank of any stationary bicycle. This tiny sensor can turn a bike that you already have into a VR workout center, allowing users to choose from a diff- different immersive games, including road cycling and tank missions. The affordability of the VR s- VZ sensor makes Verzoom a lot more accessible to people looking to give their workouts a gaming twist. Now, I thought that this was an awesome invention in terms of trying to get people excited about exercise, but making it a little more fun than just, you know, not doing just sitting on a stationary bike alone or trying to get on a treadmill and just walk. I love this. I have been screaming for something like this ever since I got a VR headset or since VR came back into the mainstream. I have always thought that applications like this are what's going to revolutionize VR and not the gaming, right? But I, it's, it's gamifying workouts, which a lot of people are not motivated to do workouts. But if you are able to, you know, have them play a game, basically, where your controller is your body... Uh, that that to me screams great idea. So uh, you mentioned here, uh, or the article mentions rather, that you have to hold a controller while you're on this um, for some games, right? So, um, <laughs> you know, to fire your tank cannons or whatever. But I still think it's, it's an amazing uh, thing for getting people off their asses and <laughs> exercising. Like, I want one of these. Yeah, I would even love to do it, too, because, I mean, I don't know. I hate doing cardio workouts solely, but I know that's something I definitely need to work on. And this is a great thing that, like, you can just take, go to your local gym, or if you even have a stationary bike at home, it's, like, an entertaining way to burn some calories and work out. And, like, this combined with, I don't know, some boxing games that come for VR now, I'd be set. Right, so there are some... um... Let, let me go over this. So, so obviously the, the plus side is that you can, you can bike along beautiful environments. And the biggest draw for me in VR is to be able to experience these surreal environments that like you could bike on Mars, you could bike on the most elaborate alien planet that you can find on the store. Um, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like if somebody has created it, you can, you can do it feasibly um, as long as, you create it. And so there is really no limit to these extraordinary places that you can visit bottom of the ocean. It doesn't matter. You can go wherever you want as long as somebody makes it. Or if you're crafty, you can make it yourself. Now the downside, there's a couple of them here. Um, is that one, you could potentially lose your balance if you're holding a controller rather than the bike. Um, two, you're going to get your VR headset very sweaty. Uh, so be careful with like 
you, you might want to put like a towel in in there or something to stop your face from getting all like VR headsets get hot already. And so I can't imagine doing cardio in a headset. Like I would have to have a big old fan blowing on me at all times, like to, to even counteract this. Um, yeah, and you know, you bring a good point with losing balance on a stationary bike because it's the last thing you want to do is fall off one of those with a VR headset on. And now that I kind of think about it, it seems like this is maybe more meant for, or maybe it's not, and maybe this is a better use for it, is those bikes that have like a seated position versus where you're ah. not at, your arms aren't really on anything. You're just kind of like seated, but you're pedaling still. So, so this, they have, okay, they have their own bike. And then they have this attachment that you can hook onto an existing bike, and that's what this is. So, so basically, it's uh, it kind of measures the RPM of your existing bike. So you could basically take your real bike, toss it on this device, which is kind of like a tripod, and it reads the RPM, and then uh, exercise that way. Um, and they also have their own version that uh, that is that it's basically like an exercise bike with with uh, this component built in so there's a couple way but um but yeah you i wonder if their actual version is the sit down version that would, that would make the most sense to me or else i feel like you're gonna have a lot of people falling off that bike i mean there, there could be creative ways around it but you don't really want to introduce too much of that for people that are trying to you know get into this idea of enjoying their workout I agree. I agree. And so let's just go over quickly what platforms they plan on releasing this. And I was actually surprised to see PlayStation VR as one of the releasing platforms because they kind of get they kind of get the shaft, honestly, like with all these uh, Oculus and HTC Vive exclusives and not to stop at PlayStation VR. They are going above and beyond and delivering it to Samsung Gear VR and Google Daydream, which are mobile platforms. So you could potentially do this with just a mobile device on your face. Which, again, I think this is really the move because you, I get the doing exclusive deals with your Vive or Oculus, but trying to get people really excited about a VR experience, especially one that's trying to like have like a health conscious thing behind it. Uh, launching it on all the different platforms, I think is the way to go. I, and I feel like we're only going to get a better, like better designs and more people involved if they're on all the platforms. Cause I know some of the, some of them are more, a lot more expensive than say like a gear VR or Google J dream. Right. Well you, everybody has a Google J dream in their pocket. They just need cardboard. Yeah, right? You're right. Like that's that's the that's the whole beauty of it. Like I have a Google cardboard, I have a PlayStation VR and an Oculus. Like and and I have to say the easiest to set up is the cardboard. Like <laughs> all you do is put, put put your phone in and then you start your VR app and then you're good. And it works to the fidelity where it's it's okay, right? Like it's not going to it's not going to be as good as something like the HTC Vive where you have four cameras looking at you. But it is going to be good enough for, um, you know, what what this is, where you're you're limited to like a 180 degree view, just facing forward. Yeah, I mean, I total totally get that, and I, I don't know. I think it's I think it's a good good thing to see. A lot more thought to go into like how you keep getting people more excited about VR in different aspects. But I think this is a great way forward with the adding of the workout to your VR experience. Yeah, for sure. Uh, speaking of virtual environments and VR, uh, it looks like I might be chairing a session at HFES. Uh, nothing set in stone yet, but it looks like I might be chairing VETG1. So if you're there, uh, please come to that. That will be fun. Um, more on that later. But, Blake, let's go ahead and move on to the next story. Oh, yeah. And so this is, <laughs> I'd like to call this the section of Let's Get Weird. Let's so, Get but anyway. Weird. So there's a host of bizarre medical biomedical robots that turned up at IEEE's International Conference on Robotics and Automation this year in Singapore. These robots included, but were not certainly not limited to, swallow robots that poke the stomach with needles and worm-like robots that explore the colon. Equal parts unnerving and fascinating, these bots aim to help people, perhaps in ways that we never really will actually need. But after sifting through this year's presentations, the IEEE was nice enough to narrow it down to the five most terrifying and innovative demonstrations. So Nick, are you ready to break these suckers down? Let's break these down. So this is an article by the IEEE Spectrum. 
where they break down these five uh, interesting, is that a good word for them? Interesting robots uh, from, <laughs> from uh, what is it? Uh, ICRA 2017. So let's break them down. So yeah, like you said, there was a swallow swallowable biopsy robot of doom is what they, they title it as. And basically this, uh, this kind of tumbles around in your stomach until it finds suspicious, suspicious looking tissue. And then kind of like an EpiPen, um, it, it whips out a needle and jabs a spot to, to kind of treat it. Which is, which is really an amazing concept that you can swallow something and it can go into like your internal organs, in this case, your stomach mainly and take, a biopsy without like having to cut you open or even use some of the microscopic procedures they have nowadays. You can just basically swallow what looks like a tiny little pill and it goes in there and makes the little punctures it needs. I mean, it it's an awesome feat in robotics. Right. However, from watching the video and I'm not a hundred percent sure this is the case, but it looked like that once it goes in, takes a biopsy of any tissue it finds it actually returns through your esophagus, so it's almost like it's pulled back out. Yeah. So I feel like that would be <laughs> ultra painful. I mean, if you're in a hurry, that might be the best way to go, right? Because that's the best way to get it out. It goes in that way, and I guess you could pull it out that way. If you're not in a hurry, I guess you could wait. <laughs> yeah, you could you could wait, see if it can you know withstand digestion and all that kind of stuff, which I, I would be hesitant to do if i really encourage people to check out what these devices actually look like but this guy looks he's basically just like a very small pill with a needle in the middle of him and he can you know flex up and down to make punctures in order to get like biopsy samples so i don't really know if i'd want that floating around my system right right all right let's move on to the next one uh so we got smashable fingers right and so this is sort of a, a flexible model hand hooked up with sensors and various <laughs> finger torture devices uh, that smashed, twisted, and bent the fingers in every direction, um, basically to provide the best prosthetic hand that you can get. Am I, am I missing anything on that one, Blake? <laughs> no, not at all. But honestly, this one is awesome to me because all it reminded me of was somewhere in between looking at Terminator's hand and Ex Machina. Like it's it's built of just it's built of a material that allows you for a lot more like pain and gain for a, that you would like have. Let's say if your hand got jammed in a machine, you had this prosthetic, you'd be, you'd be able to use it later, those kinds of things. But it just made me think that the world of prosthetics could really benefit from something like this, because you, I know that you lack a little bit of tactile feedback, and those yeah. things like that are hard to get that like, related to your brand or prosthetics. So I thought it was actually, of all the weird ones, pretty, pretty useful. Pretty useful indeed. I think, yeah. So like you said, there's a lack of that feedback, when you do have prosthetics, you're not able to, and especially with something like if you put your prosthetic on a hot stove, you're not going to know it's hot, right? So if it's able to withstand heat or, um, you know, if you if you kind of put it in a dangerous situation where it gets smashed on by a car or something, like a car door or something because you don't have as fine control over it as you would your regular hand. Like, yeah, there are a lot of uses for this. I just thought it was funny that they were, or not funny, uh, like, I thought it was great that they are making this thing basically indestructible. They are making the indestructible prosthetic. Yeah, they are. They're making just, they're basically making a Terminator skeleton one arm at a time. For sure. All right, let's get into the butt worms. This colonoscopy robot. <laughs> <laughs> so they, uh, they built a robot that kind of moves like a worm that inches its way up the rectum and around its, the entire colon, Right. And uh, it, it basically performs uh, a, a colonoscopy, and um, I, I guess it's less invasive than what a, a traditional colonoscopy could offer you. Yeah, I mean, it must be, or else why are they designing it? I mean, this this is called, like, the weird and wacky of the IEEE conference, but, I mean, there's reasons behind all of this stuff. Right, and absolutely. I, I don't know, man. It is blowing my mind between this story or this particular one that does the colonoscopy and then the previous one that was a little robot that could do biopsies. Like, this is something seriously out of a science fiction film that 
I wondered if I ever would see, and they're kind of coming to life, even though it's a, in a funny context. Swallowing robots to fix us. Yeah, no, it, it, well, and not swallowing robots. But yeah, no, I, I agree. I think they are coming up with some clever um, solutions to these problems that maybe we didn't see as problems. Uh, I mean, the the title of this one, The Colonoscopy Robot You Never Knew You Wanted, right? So it's the solution to problems that we didn't know were problems. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I mean, this has even, even though again, like it's things that we don't think about. This has a lot of implications too, for once we're designing much more nanotechnology style of these kinds of robots. Okay. So I'm going to move on to the next one because I really dig this one. So this is a, a laser assisted robot arm. Uh, and, and they say tries not to be a bull in a China shop, but basically what it is is Okay, so you have a laser gun. It's like Star Wars. You have a laser gun. You point it at an object that you want the the robot to get, and the robot navigates this environment, picks up the object, and returns it to you. So think about this in the sense of like a china shop, right? So you have a lot of really delicate, fragile pieces of merchandise, and you want to grab something on the top shelf. Well, you don't want to bump into anything along the way, so you just point this laser at that object, and boom, it reaches up, grabs it, and hands it to you. And uh, so they they say it has about, uh, um, they got it right about 90% of the time, and, uh, you know, the only downsides is that the thing is huge and that the arm tends to collide with other stuff in the room. So, uh, yeah, there, there, there might be some problems they still have to work through, but this... This could have a, a lot of far-reaching applications too. What if you just point a laser gun at a at a bomb and it defuses it for you? So I mean, you know, linking all these stories together. <laughs> Honestly, Nick, when you say laser gun and robot arm, I don't really care what it is. I'm already in. Sold. Um, let's see here. What uh, do you have any other thoughts on the laser robot arm? Uh, not particularly. I just I think it's funny that it can grab something with such great precision, but have just a lack of awareness outside of that. Right. So I think the title that they give with it, like trying not to be a bull in the China shop, is the perfect description of what this thing even looks like. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, okay, let's get into this last one. We've kind of talked about systems like this before on the show, but the wearable vision system that takes the ouch out of canes, and they basically are trying to address the problem of a blind person coming into a room and needing to find an empty chair. Um, but he doesn't want to go bloodying everybody's ankles by, uh, you know, bashing bashing people with his cane. So what this is is basically a vibration feedback that um, once the blind person is in the room, it will give feedback empty. Which is great. I mean, it's a, another just great use of tactile feedback to try and navigate throughout a room. And I think... Honestly, I think this is a great thing for anybody that's blind, but I think this has like applications for robots too. I mean, if it's it's got such a if it has that good of spatial awareness, like using something similar like this, although they won't need the vibrational part, being able to get a sense of what the room looks like that well is awesome. Oh yeah, for sure. All right, so all these weird wacky robots, weird wacky, weird wacky robots. Um, do you have any closing thoughts on this? I thought I, I again think that all these are great examples of thinking outside the box. And yes, they are wacky, they are weird, but we uh, we all have to strive to, to sort of think of these innovative solutions to problems that we may not even think are problems. Like, I, I think it's great, the innovation that is coming out of these conferences. And it's always it's always nice to take a minute and appreciate what other people are doing to try to fix these things. And you never know, man. Sometimes the most off-the-wall solutions to a problem turn out to be the best way to go even like even though some of them are kind of goofy i mean there's just far reaching implications for them Good stuff. i agree and that's why we bring the stuff up on the show maybe maybe one of our listeners is listening and they go i could use a swallowable robot for this or that or a laser assisted robot for something you know or this vision system so they're we're just trying to get those juices flowing basically all right man let's move on to this last story and then uh we'll talk about some reddit posts all right, so here we go. Let's wrap it up with some boats. boats. So Amer- an American Navy destroyer collided with a merchant container ship off the coast of Japan early Saturday morning. And what's confusing here is that the Fitzgerald, a five 505-foot-long Arlene, 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 
Arlene Burke class guided missile destroyer likely carried collision avoidance electronics. Now that there's no indication what specific equipment the ACX Crystal, a 732 foot container ship, carried, but even less sophisticated radar systems can offer software that calculates trajectories and alerts operators when they're on a collision course, similar to what you would see in an ATC system. So, what is likely the cause of the crash? Well, this is what Nick and I, Nick and I kind of specialize in. It's human error. So this is a speculation, but it's likely that the crews on one or both of the ships may have made a miscalculation. And because these big ships are hardly nimble, mistakes prove hard to actually correct. Ships collide much more frequently than you often think, with as many as one per day throughout the ocean. And one... Th- and the only thing you can really do is study what happened and try and remember lessons for next time. Now, this feels just like it's got human factors written all over it because it's a, it's a boat. It's dealing with two boats that likely had collision avoidance systems that were built into them to avoid this very thing. But somehow it still happened. It does. And let me just – so working with inf- infantry and uh, service – people in the service like i one of the first things they do because they're always so annoying and some of the time they're wrong right and rather trust their intuition and i feel like that may have been what happened here they just turned off those signals and look i know what i'm doing and they actually didn't know what they were doing so you know building in these alarms and alerting this training aspect of are you able to reliably assess situations <laughs> And also course correct if need be. So, yeah, they're late, but I don't think they've come out and said what the official cause. Um, I think they they're speculating that it's human error, but we don't know for sure. But it's always late. What 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 are you thinking about this one? So I thought, like when I was thinking about it, that the ocean is so big, and even though these ships are big, you would think that they would be able to course correct at some point. But I, I'm sure that the time to make changes, and like you're saying, if if these systems are old, these collision avoidance systems on ships, even on some of the newer carriers or on the container ship, if they're newer, they still might not be something that the crew totally adapts because it could be they're designed poorly and they send off a lot more false alarms. So you do have people turning them off. Right. Uh, Likely what I think happens is if they even recognized what the issue was, there's not a whole lot that you can do about it because these things are so big, traveling at such a speed, even though the ocean is a giant place. Uh, I, I don't. Again, I, I want to emphasize as well that you never know if this is actually a human error case. Uh, but the only thing you can really do is kind of look back based on the data that's presented from these collision avoidance systems if, if both ships had them. And then kind of work backwards from there and understand based off what the crew said and based off of like comparisons of both crews, what they're saying happened and the damage, that kind of stuff. Kind of do a work backwards and understand what happened and then move forward with some lessons learned. Right. I agree. Yeah. Uh, Do you want to go into this note that you have or should we start on the Reddit stuff? Uh. We can just start on the Reddit stuff. What Nick's talking about is I had a little note about the critical incident technique, which is basically what I just described. You kind of work backwards from the problem, starting with the root cause and try and identify, you know, how you can solve it next time or avoid it next time. Right. Okay, cool. Um, All right. So let's go ahead. That's all the news that we had for this week. So let's go ahead and switch news. Wow. Switch news. Let's switch gears into uh, it came from Reddit. Now, this is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics that the community you guys are talking about. So now any subreddit is fair game as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion among the community. This is part of our community outreach. We always want to reach out to you guys and kind of provide our feedback. And, uh, you know, if anyone has any specific questions for us, you can uh, email us at humanfactorscast at gmail.com, and we'd be more than happy to answer those on the show. All right, so today's entry, we have two of them. We're catching up from uh, last week where we didn't really answer anything. So let's go ahead and do the first one here, which is from the user experience subreddit from Justin PJ. So Justin PJ writes, putting failed project on portfolio. I am currently in the middle of making a portfolio, and because I have a lack of projects, I was thinking about putting on a project that failed. 
I was thinking of going through the process and analyzing why that project failed, but would this be a good thing to put on a portfolio or would it hurt me? Blake, what do you think about this one? Because I have very strong feelings about this one. Yeah, so I do too. And I and unfortunately, my strong feelings are very much a psychology answer. But I'll do my best to give, give you my opinion because you, you <laughs> obviously never know if this is going to hurt you or not. Um, I would err on the side of if you have good projects that were successful, make sure those are up there too. And if you have the grace enough to show something that failed, be be very honest about it and try and not only show like why it failed, but what you think you could have done differently, like really express your design thinking and how you could look at the problem in a different way. Cause it, honestly, this could be that I'm not sure what the case for Justin PJ was, but it could be that maybe just stakeholders didn't allow things to go the way that the design team put it together. Maybe there was just a, a run out of funds. You couldn't do as much user research. I mean, bad things happen and you're not always going to get it right. And I think there is something to be said for being able to look at a project that failed or just didn't go as successfully. Talk about why that was the case and how you would have done, do, done things differently. Or if you had a second chance, how you would move things forward from that point on. So I have to tell a story about this because I am a huge advocate for putting things on that you failed on. So on one hand, yes, you failed. But to me, failing is the biggest opportunity for learning. Like you said, Blake, why did it fail? Uh, what what things could you have done differently? So I did exactly this. I put something like this that was a failed uh, project on my portfolio. And, you know, I did follow your advice, Blake, and I, I put it up next to stuff that was successful. And uh, one of the things, I, I actually gave a job talk when I was uh, interviewing for several jobs. And... Uh, when I was giving this job talk, I said right up front, this is a failed experiment, but I wanted to include it as, uh, you know, an example of a time where I, I learned from what I did wrong. And so I, I gave a whole presentation on what I, what I did wrong. And then I went into something that was successful, right? Using the lessons learned from the previous example. So if you tell a story around it, it could potentially work. Now, Here's the interesting part. So this was this was a day long interview, and it was it was a it was a quite a long process. And during the whole thing, about halfway through the day, the job talk was in the very morning, and then and then about halfway through the day, they they give me this um this design challenge, and man, they they were right on top of it, man. They 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 said, okay, so your design challenge is that failed project that you mentioned earlier. How would you go about it differently? And I was like. Oh, wow, this is interesting. So, like, they, they basically took that failed project and used it as a prompt against me, and uh, I think I aced that one. So uh, just, a, just a lesson is that you can, you can learn from these and you can use them as, uh, as kind of these springboards to say, look, I learned from this. So I, I am in 100% agreement that you should put it on your portfolio. Most definitely. And I think, Nick, you bring up the, probably the most important point about it is understand the narrative that you have behind it and what you would do moving forward. Like it's it's not really you just want to put it up. Oh, this was a failed project. You you want to understand and convey why it did and how you would change it or what you would do differently. Right, right. Uh, OK, any closing thoughts on that one? Let's let's move on to Mr. This Fats is Fats. This is Fats. All right. So this is Fats from also from the user experience subreddit writes the question starting a new job tomorrow as a ux designer for an e-commerce company what would you do to impress colleagues within the first six months now blake i know i know you you gave a webinar on something like this recently right yes so recently and if you guys want to check it out it's up on youtube it's through uxpla and it's just their youtube channel so if you type in uxpla to google and YouTube, you'll find it. And it's uh, it was a conversation with me and two of my colleagues and an author. His name is Dave Maloof, and he works for DigitalOcean. And he's a big UX thought leader. And this co the concept was all about UX leadership and what you kind of want to do in those first 90 days. Uh, and so we would go into depth about different, different approaches you could take and things like that. And to be honest, the biggest takeaway that I got was to really like you're, you're a UX designer 
you know what space you're going into, so that's good, but really humble yourself and take the time to understand your company's goals. Because you, you're bringing a lot, like a really nice skill set to the table, and you can enact a lot of change, and you will want to like show ROI as you go, but it's going to pay off a lot to really understand your stakeholders and what your actual business goals are and who the key players in your company are that you need to talk to in order to, to get design changes through or to get that user experience study done. Um, I think that was really the biggest take I had as far as trying to what you could do in the first like 90 days was really understand the company. Right. And I, just to piggyback off of that, like I'm, I'm, uh, Obviously, you can have your off days, and that's fine. But be on for those six, those first six months. Like, just do not stop going. Produce the best work of your life. Push yourself to again align, like you said, Blake. Align with the company's goals and try to give them something that they're looking for. Um, and by developing those habits early in your uh, career, there, then potentially you will establish a, a routine where you continuously produce great work and they um, peg you as a valuable member of their team. So that's kind of my advice too. You mentioned the top takeaway, Blake, but what are like the top three? Can you give me like two more? Yeah. So the big one that I would, I kind of would go after, especially since you're working at an e-commerce company is gauge the acceptance of UX in your company as of the day you walk in the door. Like, what is the mature level in the company? Do they know what you do? Do they hire you because it's like it's a big buzzword right now? Uh, so really understand how well they understand what you do. That's and that'll give you a gauge as to how you get into their processes. Um, again, trying to be specific to the e-commerce, go talk to your developers and really figure out where in their process you fit in and where you can like get your tidbits in there and how best to work with them. Cause those are going to be really your go-to guys that often you have to get on your side of the table and really show that ROI to along, along with like higher level stakeholders, but likely you're going to be working hand in hand with a developer. So get, get on the good side of that team, understand how their sprint process works or whatever methodology they're using and start figuring out how to show them ROI. Man, Blake, that is some solid advice. I think I think we're ready to wrap this up for this week. We are glad. I'm, dude, I'm so glad to be back. I missed us last week, and I got to tell you, <laughs> I really missed Human Factors Cast last week. Well, that's going to be it for today, everyone. Let us know what you think of It Came From Reddit. Do you like it, hate it? Let us know. If you have any suggestions for topics, news stories that you want us to cover, you can head on over to social media. We're on the Facebook Human Factors Cast at LinkedIn facebook or twitter at h factors podcast you can join the discussion on our soundcloud or send us an email at human factors cast at gmail.com if you're feeling saucy leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432 that's 901-646-1hfc you can also support us on patreon at patreon.com slash human factors cast we love to bring these things to you ad free and of course we do miss some weeks but if we were paid maybe we wouldn't miss some weeks just kidding all right be sure to like subscribe review us on apple Podcasts, google play store or whatever your favorite podcast directory is and of course you can always reach us at our home on the web humanfactorscast.com mr blake arnsdorf thanks for being on the show today as always where can our listeners find you Always a pleasure, Mr. Nick, and you can find me at Don't Panic UX. Don't Panic UX. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends. Oh, it does depend. Crashing boats. Human error. Legislation. Intuitive robots. Bomb diffusing robots and stuff. VR bikes.